Hi, my name is Bailey Miller. I am a respiratory therapist at Primary Children's Hospital CF Center in Salt Lake City, Utah. And today I am presenting on overcoming barriers and driving adoption for home spirometry in the pediatric CF population. I have the following relationship to disclose related to my presentation. The goal of this presentation is to explore the different methods for utilizing home spirometry devices in order to meet or exceed the CF clinical care guidelines for obtaining lung function data, to identify what patient education tools have helped to empower device use and overall patient participation in the home spirometry program, and to recognize that there are current barriers to home spirometry, but that there's also a prospective role for clinical decision-making. To provide a background of home spirometry, the CF Foundation distributed these FDA-approved spirometry devices to CF patients across the nation. There's a lot of guidelines about how remote patient monitoring helps in relationship to COVID-19 restrictions, which has resulted in less in-person PFTs. And remote patient monitoring, or specifically home spirometry, allows for earlier detection of declining lung function and prompt initiation of treatment plans given that decline. It also allows for providers to monitor how effective their treatments are and to follow the national best care practice guidelines for obtaining lung function data quarterly. So in order to determine device distribution, we utilize the CF Foundation's COVID-19 Medical Advisory Board to prioritize which patients. We also uh, established our own criteria in collaboration with our CF director in order to determine which patients would be a candidate for receiving a device. We determined that the most important thing is that the patient has demonstrated the ability to properly perform PFTs, which means they have met the American Thoracic Society guidelines for acceptability and repeatability. We also chose a patient age of six years and older based on maturity and ability per to perform. We looked at the number of times that the patient has been admitted, as well as how many times they've been treated in the home setting for exacerbations. It was important to consider distance to center. So some of our patients are served across state lines and a quite the mile radius from our center. So we prioritize patients that had to travel further for clinic appointments. And providers found it was helpful on a patient by patient basis based on the needs of the patient. We distributed our devices in patient groups of 20 to 30 at a time. And we have 120 devices that have been distributed within our center. This equates to 65% of the age eligible patient population. Here's a quick snapshot of the demographic of home spirometry patients. So we have 46% that are male and 54% that are female. And you can see on the right hand side, it shows the correlation in age and how many patients have devices. We notify our patients that they are receiving a device based on a standardized script. And in this script, we take the opportunity to set expectations early of what we're looking for in our home spirometry patients. This script allows for us to state to the family that we're looking for them to do the home spirometry quarterly. And by agreeing to receive the device, they acknowledge that information. We also request that the families contact us once they receive the device. Um, and then we would set up the initial education appointment. We often find that we are chasing patients to get this initial education scheduled since a lot of them have a lot going on. So we have found it's helpful to take the tracking number of the device and watch once it's delivered, we will contact them to get them set up for their initial education. Here are some of the barriers that we've experienced with home spirometry. It is time intensive for the patient to obtain the data, but also for the data to be reviewed by the staff members. We've had obstacles in getting proper reimbursement to justify the time that we are spending in home spirometry. And we've also had experiences with state licensure for telehealth, meaning that if our provider is not licensed in the area in which we are practicing, um, we may not be able to provide telemedicine services there. We've also had a hard time getting our patients to send us results within our recommendation. And so we came up with a program a reminder method that I will discuss later in my presentation. 
Our provider dashboard, we wanted to access that to get a better look at what the data was portraying. And we had a hard time getting through the purchase agreement liability. It was just very time intensive. It took a long time to get the BAA and all that worked out. And then data interpretation. So with the screen, we were originally having our patients screenshot their results to us and sending them via email. And it was hard to see whether the patient was actually meeting the ATS acceptability repeatability criteria. So um, I'll discuss that later in my presentation as well. We place a standing 52-week order in the patient's electronic medical record. We place it on a recurring encounter, and we note that home spirometry should be performed as directed. This order includes any encounter related to home spirometry, including the initial education, the subsequent data import and upload, and any session we might need to meet to assess technique. We also include an order attestation, and this justifies the RT encounter via virtual visit. I have attached what we put there below, but essentially this helps us give information, doc provide documentation that this is a medically necessary service. We have utilized the billing CPT code of 94799, which is an unlisted code. We define the encounter in the special instructions box, including whether it's a data download or collection, education, or initial instruction. We indicate to the charge entry staff that the comparison code is 94015. And we also include the virtual visit attestation in our order comments. I'd like to disclose that we have recently stopped using the CPT code due to the strict requirements of our revenue cycle on getting reimbursed for this service. So all of the results that are sent to us are reviewed by a respiratory therapist and to ensure data accuracy prior to uploading it to the patient's chart. We start by ensuring that the de patient demographics correlate with what's in our system, and then we check the flow volume loop to make sure it meets the ATS acceptability criteria. We can typically look at the loop and the values and, and be able to suspect whether or not the patient is given maximal effort. But if we have any doubts or any questions, we'll then contact the family to see how the session went for them. We upload a PDF data report from the provider dashboard to the patient's electronic medical record. And then these results are sent to our pulmonologist for interpretation and our pulmonologists are billing for their interpretation services. We also found a lot of value in setting the patient expectations to obtain lung function data. So we tell them what the time of receiving the device that they will be doing it quarterly or every 90 days. And then we also educate them this during the patient education portion as well. Uh, but we track it here and I included a screenshot of what our Excel result tracking form looks like. And essentially you see there in the red circle that it highlights any patient that has over the 90 day period so that we can contact them to see if they would like help on getting the, their lung function results that are due for that month. We request that patients um, do the home spirometry quarterly, whether that's in person or through remote patient monitoring. Um, but we don't know, we don't require them to do both. So if the patient does uh, in person PFT, we don't require home spirometry. We also request that patients do home spirometry before a telehealth appointment with their provider. Once they submit that results, we will review it as in the RT staff, and then we will upload that to the provider that they were, are seeing. We also do follow-up testing after clinic appointments if the provider requests follow-up PFTs, and we will oftentimes do that via home spirometry if the patient has any variables or any barriers to getting back to clinic. So in order to support patients on device consistency, we found it was um, important to give them a results due reminder. And we basically standardize a message through email that um, gives the patient a heads up that they're due for results. We will send results two per month per patient via email or through their electronic medical records messaging system. This message is standardized and we just basically put in there that they're overdue for the results and to contact us if they have any questions. And we include the tips or tricks or other updates related to home spirometry. So it acts as a communication email for the home spirometry program in general. We found that phone calls were an unsuccessful reminder method, given that it was very time intensive for the RT staff, but we got feedback from our patients that it was actually non-preferred. 
We have found since implementing this that more patients are doing unsupervised PFTs and sending us results. And then a lot less reminder messages are, or a lot less volume of reminder messages are being sent every month. Here is our results adherence. Our goal is that we have 80% of our patients sending results every 90 days. And you can see that we have had a high of 93.3% in February and that we've dropped in May to as low as 71.3%. Just like to point out the home spirometry is an evolving uh, thing that we're still learning how to navigate with our patients. And so we're working through different um, quality initiatives to make sure that we're getting those results. But you can see that it kind of dipped in the summer months. So we're suspecting that patients were likely more busy in the summer, um, but we're looking at different ways that we can figure out what is actually influencing patients to check their lung function data and send it to us. So what do you do with decreased lung function? Um, we determined a decreased lung function is anything that is greater than or equal to 10% decline in the percent predicted of FEC1 and or FEV1. So I uh, put over here our home spirometry flow chart. Flow chart. Um, we have our patients do a meet now session, and that's where we assess technique. So we will do a full session with the patient to look to make sure that they're meeting all of the technical components of a PFT. We will also ensure that the patient used the correct demographics. We have had a lot of patients that may put the wrong birth date in or their height is wrong, and that directly influences their lung function data. So that's one of the things we rule out with them. We will then administer a bronchodilator per our protocol. And so we give four puffs of albuterol, wait the 10 minutes, and then we will retest their lung function data. In the event that their lung function is still down and we haven't ruled out any technical or demographical component, then we will request that the nurse triage group evaluates their symptoms and notify the provider. Some of the um, evaluations that we've had with nurses, they, they typically will have an in collaboration with the providers, um, consider obtaining a new CF culture, uh, treating at home, including airway clearance therapy, uh, antibiotics, or a follow-up appointment, or they will have them repeat PFTs if needed, and even consider having the patient come in person with a clinic appointment to do a full assessment. So our patient education, we found that there were a lot of barriers to device use just based on what the patients portrayed and what they understood about the device in general. So we do a 60 minute initial education provided by a virtual via virtual visit. And oftentimes this may run over into the 90 minute mark if families have a lot of questions. Um, we start by just going over a basic device use. So this includes setting up the turbine, putting the mouthpiece on, and then the application. We also go over an initial PFT session. So we will coach the patient through a full session and show them how their data correlates with their most recent in-person PFT. And then we go over cleaning and disinfecting. So what does the results screen mean? Uh, patient feedback gave uh, was on limitations for device use was that they did not understand the results screen or their inability to interpret the results screen. So we spend a solid portion of our education just going over how to interpret this results screen and what we're trending in clinic versus what we're looking at here. A lot of our patients were looking at the FEV1 FEC ratio and taking that for their FEV1. And so they either thought they were a lot higher or a lot lower than their actual true lung function. And we also teach them to look for acceptability components in a PFT, making sure that they have a strong peak, make sure they have a nice and continuous blast and squeeze out. When we are setting up our initial education appointment on the phone, um, we ask that the patient obtains a heightened weight prior to the scheduled virtual appointment. And we provide them video links via email that gives them information on how to obtain the accurate height. And we also provide in that email the user guide for the home spirometry device and our actual training sheet that we're going to go and follow step by step with them. The patients are instructed on device use for validating symptoms, but they're also instructed on keys to success. So on the left-hand side, you will see a list of the symptoms that we have patients uh, just educate themselves on. We ideally want them to know when they're feeling a specific way that they are using the home spirometry to validate symptoms, but that they need to communicate with CF, our CF team if they're experiencing symptoms in general, regardless of their lung function data. So our keys to success, I highlighted in red, good communication with your CF care team is critical to success. And we drive this message home during our initial education. We 
We also include our uh, home spirometry in annual respiratory assessments. We take this moment with our captive audience to ensure that they are following the manufacturer's cleaning and disinfecting guidelines, and it provides the opportunity to re-educate them on device use. We've had lots of patients that have questions about how to use the device and have taken the opportunity during their annual respiratory assessment to ask us. And if we have time, we will even do a meet now session and go over technique with them at that given moment. There is a lot of significance in validating the device in front of the patient. So we have the patient bring the home spirometry device to clinic, and we compare it to our hospital-based PFT uh, systems. So what we do is we'll have the patient begin on their own, um, on our clinic system first, and have the patient perform a PFT, and then we will have them perform a PFT on their home spirometry device. We will actually have them open the application and navigate it on their own, making sure that we use the same exact height and weight from our pulmonary or hospital-based equipment. A successful device validation criteria is that the patient has demonstrated the ability to perform with maximal effort, and that the FEC and FEV1 are within the ATS repeatability criteria of the 0.15 liters between the hospital-based equipment and the home-based unit. So the feedback we've received here is that it's a lot of, it's very advantages for the patient. So it, per, it allows them to have the participation with the respiratory therapist for hands-on practice. And it also provides an opportunity for us to review or re-educate the patient if needed. Patients have told us that it improves their, their confidence in the device. So they felt that it helps them understand device and application use and to demonstrate that to us, but also to understand the precision and accuracy of the data, to understand that there is an actual correlation between our hospital-based unit and the home-based unit. And a patient even told us that they enjoy having that trend because it provides them with their actual, we provide them with their actual volumes in liters, and they were able to see that they were within that repeatability criteria on their home base unit. So, what is the future of home spirometry? We're hoping that home spirometry will continue to be a remote patient monitoring technique and the epic of modulator therapy. We understand that evolving COVID-19 and other health restrictions for high-risk aerosol-generating procedures amongst a vulnerable patient population will require us to get creative to obtain their lung function data. It's a very cost-effective approach to patient monitoring. We know that there's going to be evolving state and federal regulations and hopefully soon an assigned CPT code to lung function data. And then we know that there are advantages of using the thorough home-based disease monitoring as an alternative to the periodic hospital-based data collection. So in summary, I've highlighted the importance of setting patient expectations and implementing standardized processes around all aspects of remote, remote lung function monitoring. Home spirometry is clinically informative, and it does correlate well with hospital-based systems. There are advantages to overcoming the reimbursement barriers in order to implement remote patient monitoring in your center. And the COVID-19 pandemic has called attention to dig digital technologies in healthcare, specifically advantages related to remote patient monitoring. I'd like to acknowledge Lloyd Warner, my manager, for his continued guidance and support while navigating the application of home spirometry, and Kathleen Richards for her years of mentorship and being at the forefront of our center's home spirometry implementation. Thank you for joining my presentation today. Hi, I'm Abby Good. I'm a physical therapist at the Children's Hospital of Colorado. I'm here to talk to you about Unite to Thrive, a virtual wellness group. I have no relationship to disclose related to this presentation. So our objectives today are to summarize the components of Unite to Thrive, a virtual wellness group that was co-delivered by myself and our, one of our psychologists, Courtney Lynn. I'm going to review the process for program development how we implemented the group and the interventions that we use during group. I'm gonna discuss the acceptability and the preliminary effectiveness of Unite to Thrive in our adolescents with CF. So first we identified a need. We were really hearing um, 
kids in clinic talk a lot about feeling so socially isolated during COVID and quarantine specifically. They're feeling deconditioned and out of shape. Um, they were had a decrease um, decreased participation in activities or sports. Um, you know, playing their instruments, having play dates. So no PE in school. I mean, just decreased participation generally. Um, there was a big increase in um, reports of anxiety and depression. And there was poor motivation to participate in activities and wellness strategies. And I think people just felt very disoriented. You know, they'd never had to exercise from home and they didn't really know what to do. So <laughs> COVID, we did find some silver linings. Um, this group was one of them for sure. Um, so one thing we noticed was that telemedicine, um, it, it, was, it was really accelerated the way that we utilized it for patient care, um, which made it possible to do this group. Um, Cordy and I had more time. Um, we had a, a lot more time to collaborate and like, and, and plan this, this cool thing that is unite, unite to thrive. Um, so we had a lot of meetings. <laughs> we did a lot, a lot of, um, work on our manual that we created for the program. So time was on our side. Um, group therapy, uh, historically has, has not you, we haven't been able to do any in our, in our patients with CF because of infection control. And so telemedicine gave us this opportunity to have a new model for group. Um, so that, that was really um, special. Um, and then lastly, you know, people had time. <laughs> Their schedules were wide open. They were doing school from home remotely and um, they didn't have any of their after school activities with telemedicine. No one needed a ride to get to group. Um, they did it from their, from their bedroom or from their living room. So um, that all, all these things combined really made it possible for us to sort of launch this program. So Unite to Thrive was born. Now, Thrive stands for talent, health, relationships, inspiration, vision, and empowerment. So these are the things that we are trying to embody in group. So how we implemented group. It was a four to six week group, and we met weekly for 90 minutes. Um, I would do about 45 minutes and Courtney would do about 45 minutes. Um, and uh, our first session, we've done three different groups so far. Our first group that we offered um, was six weeks long. It was with 17 and 18 year old females. Um, and from their feedback, we decreased it to four weeks. And we've run two other groups um, since then that were each four weeks and it worked, it worked well. So we just sort of consolidated our manual and our program. Um, so once we identified a patient that wanted to participate, we would schedule them in Epic. We um, templated our, our schedules so that everyone could kind of get in there. Um, insurance benefits were checked. Um, we really didn't have a ton of issues with insurance. Um, we're fortunate. Uh, a large uh, part of our, our population has Medicaid, which um, supported telemed and group. So that was good. And um, private insurances also, most of them covered it as well. Um, so our group met online using telemedicine. In our center, we use Video Connect. Um, we sent the manual to our patients via email. Um, it's about 50 pages long or so. Um, and it had the curriculum. Um, it had an equipment list that they needed, uh, and it had home exercises that we wanted them to be doing. Um, I will say with the equipment, I really tried to keep it super simple. You know, they needed to have a towel, some sort of soccer ball, volleyball, basketball, I don't know, four square ball, um, a chair. Uh, and if they had weights, great. Soup cans worked. And some of the patients also had bands um, from working with me in clinic. Um, but we really kept it simple to make it um, the carryover easier. Um, our participants filled out questionnaires before and after group um, where we would get feedback, just like 
subjective information from them at the end of group. Um, and then we also use outcome measures. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those um, later in the presentation. So recruiting. <laughs> recruiting was hard. It was, took a lot of time. Um, Courtney and I would talk a lot about it. Um, so the way that we sort of went about doing it was we picked target age ranges and genders, and we would pull a list from the CF registry. Um, we pulled lots of different lists and kind of looked at the groupings of patients and discussed, you know, who we thought would want to do it and, you know, who would be sort of good, good pairs. And um, so it was a process for sure. Um, we did develop a flyer that we would send out to people um, via email just to kind of spread the word, give give um, a brief description of group, um, what it entailed. We also created some dot phrases in Epic that we could pull into our notes or um, in their after visit summary that gave a lot of information as well. Um, so for kids that we were seeing in clinic, we talked to them about it in clinic. And for those that weren't going to be in clinic before groups started, we'd reach out to them via phone or my chart or email. So, all right, our manual. Um, so we developed the manual with week by week content. The content was um, based on evidence-based exercise, adherence, and behavioral interventions. And the sessions were designed so that PT and psychology really complemented each other. Um, it built on itself week by week. So it got harder as we went on. Um, and we really did a lot of foundational activities early on, such as proper breathing techniques. Um, and then and then we we did paired things that we thought would um, just enhance a patient's experience. So our outcome measures that we use. So pre and post full group, we had them fill out the CFQR and um, the child and adolescent mindfulness measure, which is called the CAM. Uh, and then before and after each session, um, we would ask them about pain using, using the visual analog scale, the zero to 10, and the modified board scale to um, get a sense of their shortness of breath. And this helped us understand just how they were tolerating each session, how difficult it was, how they felt before and after. Um, and for one of the sessions, we also use heart rate throughout the session to monitor exertion. So. All right, our program, here's a little snapshot and then we're gonna dive into everything. So week one was breathing and mobility. Um, and we paired that with goal setting and health related values, just to get, get things going, get everyone hooked. Week two, we did yoga and breathing and relaxation. Week three was Pilates and mindfulness. Week four was strength training and diffusion of thoughts. Week five, we did high, a high intensity interval training workout and we did acceptance of feelings. Week six, uh, we had the patients design their own workouts and teach their peers. Um, and then Courtney tied it all together. So, week one, what's important to you? So, as I said, um, we started with the foundation of group. Um, we, we really talked about um, health-related values. So some examples of these are fitness, fun, commitment, cooperation, self-awareness, self-care, uh, spirituality, mindfulness, excitement, health, self-control. So those are just a couple. And, and that really helped pati patients and participants to write goals for themselves. They thought about what was important and then they wrote a, wrote a goal surrounding it. Um, so that was sort of the intro for psychology. And physical therapy, We um, I talked a lot about the diaphragm and why it's important. We talked about the intercostal muscles. Um, we talked about alignment for good breathing and practiced all of this. Um, and then we did a lot of mobility for the chest wall and the spine and just really um, moving the trunk and linking breathing with that. So this was a really good feel-good session. It was a really good way to start everything up. Um, and everyone really enjoyed it. I think they felt good after. And so they were, uh, again, it was our hook. So week two, how do I relax my body? So 
we first started talking about um, our different nervous systems, um, our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system and how breathing comes into play um, uh, with these systems. Um, we did, we started with box breathing just to get them relaxed and breathing and went into our yoga session after that. Um, I will say I have my yoga teacher training. And so um, I think that kept it safe. Um, you know, uh, we went through sun salutations, balancing poses, heart openers, hip, op hip openers, and then we ended with a restorative yoga pose. And there, um, Courtney did a progressive muscle relaxation. Um, which was, which was great. Uh, we gave them a bunch of yoga resources and their homework was to take at least one yoga class on their own. Um, and I gave them a lot of education about the variety of yoga classes, the different types that there are. So it's not a one size fits all model. It's like, you can find a yoga class that you enjoy based on your skills and your goals. So we talked a lot about that and had them practice that on their own. Week three, what is mindfulness and how do I do it? So we talked a lot about mindfulness and um, being in control of your mind rather than your mind being in control of you. Um, and Courtney took us through some mindfulness exercises to get us going. And then PT, um, we did a Pilates session and we sort of related the two because Pilates, you really have to be thoughtful about your movement. Your, your brain and your body are really working together to be successful with all of these different positions and postures. Um, so it was a really nice uh, complimentary uh, session. Um, and I, I talked about all the different types of Pilates as well and sort of the history of Pilates um, and how it can positively impact bone health as well. So some good patient education along the way. Um, and they, and, and you can see it's starting to get a little harder as we go. So week four, how do I notice my thoughts? So this week, the PT um, session was a strength training session. Um, and so I, I discussed again, um, how strength training is helpful for bone health. Um, we talked a lot about just the benefits of strength training, uh, why our muscles get sore, how long it takes to build strength. Um, so there was a lot of patient education up front before we did our workout. And Courtney went into diffusion of thoughts. So um, we did a lot of exercises, you know, where we said an I statement, like uh, an example would be, I feel weak. And we used that statement and we changed it. And we said, I'm noticing I'm having the thought that I'm weak and sort of acknowledged how we could step back from this negative feeling and it would allow us to, to forget about it and complete hard things. And so it was really cool for them with the strength training because we were getting them uncomfortable. <laughs> we're making their muscles burn. Um, and, and then they got to kind of practice this thought of, I'm noticing the thought that my muscles tired and so take taking steps back it was it was very cool <laughs> um all right so then week five how do I sit with my uncomfortable feelings um so Courtney int introduced this session she talked a lot about all the different emotions that we have and that a lot of emotions that we experience are negative I think something like six out of nine human emotions are negative and so we're going to have these negative feelings in our life, in our experience. And um, we started the session with that. And then we went into this hard hit workout. Um, you know, I, I taught them about different training zones. We did the Carbonin formula. We plugged their resting heart rate um, into the formula and figured out which training zone we were trying to get in. Um, and the way that hit works is you do an exercise for a burst of time. So we did 30 seconds on 30 seconds off. And during our 30 second rest, we would have them write down feelings like, oh, I'm tired. I'm grumpy. <laughs> this is hard. You know, um, all these different emotions that were bubbling up for them. Um, and so, and then they got to process them. Um, and, and, you know, by the end we said, yeah, you had all these feelings. Did you, were you able to complete the workout? And everyone did. So it was really neat. 
Um, I will say too, it was very cool because our first cycle of hit, um, a lot, I think in every group, we were just shy of that training zone. And so it was, it was really cool to do the workout with the group and then realize we've got to make it harder this second round and talking to them about making progressing or modifying and how to, how to like kind of meet the goal and get in the right training zone to, to better their lung health. So I'm um, really good hands-on, like in the moment training. So this one was a fun week. And week six, how do I maintain my wellness? So we wrapped everything up. The patients did their own workout routines, which was really cool. They were so proud of themselves. They worked really hard on them. We talked about their goal progress and just overall how they felt about, uh, about group. And here's what they had to say. It was nice to relate in a way others may not understand. I really, really love learning about different stretches and exercises for my lungs. It really makes me feel like I'm caring for myself. The most helpful part of the group was the fact that I knew everyone understood what I lived through, and it made me feel comfortable. I think the most helpful thing was having a different perspective on thinking that I know I won't be judged. Also, the workouts are simple enough. I can do them on my own. So here's some of our preliminary data. Um, and I just want to note that Courtney's doing, she's doing a deeper dive into all of our data tomorrow um, uh, from 3.15 to 5.15. So tune in if you're curious. And we also have a poster that has a lot more data as well, which is um, on the bottom there. So our CFQR scores increased in a couple different domains. Uh, ph physical increased by nine points, which is considered a large effect size. We had a 10 point increase in vitality um, and a six point increase in emotion, which were both considered medium effect size. We were pretty, we were pretty pleased with that. Um, the mean CAM scores increased from 22.91 to 27.89 over the course of intervention, which is a positive, positive improvement. So some lessons that we learned. Recruiting can be very time consuming and hard and hard. Um, females were more likely to participate in group than males. And we tried recruiting for a male group a couple different times and um, we just couldn't get them there. Uh -huh. We did have te technology impacted some of the kids' participation. They either didn't have a device to do telemedicine or their device just didn't work. Like they tried to get onto the call our first group and couldn't, which was a bummer. Um, it can be difficult to monitor patients during group activities. I think this is fair to say in any group that you do, but especially on telemedicine, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to give people the cues that they need and be able to see them because the frames are a little bit smaller in a group. So some of our next steps are we'd like to try some wearable technology and measure just different activity levels over time. Um, and if they're able to sustain these activity levels um, over a longer period of time. We're looking for some grant funding to maybe um, have some sort of incentive uh, to participate and get people over that hump. Um, we'd like to utilize, uh, potentially util utilize some other outcome measures, um, the social impact of disease scale, and then the international physical activity questionnaire are, are a couple that we've considered. Um, and then we'd like to be able to compare males versus females and how they respond to group. So here are my references. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you got some, I don't know, some inspiration. And um, I, I hope that you enjoyed hearing about you Nice Thrive. It was really nice to have you. Hello, and thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak today. I am Pamela Scarborough, and I've been asked to present to you um, my learnings and experience from BEAM, where I deliver um, exercise education and well-being sessions for the um, global cystic fibrosis community. So my disclosure for this session um, is that, um, and is also the reason that I'm here, I am co-founder and clinical director at beamfeelgood.com. 
So a little bit more about my background. I am a cystic fibrosis physiotherapist from the UK. I worked in the NHS uh, for 15 years at um, four different CF care centers. I've always been really passionate about the role of exercise for physical and emotional health, as well as innovative ways to deliver services to try and ease the burden of care and improve adherence to therapies. I am also a, um, a yoga teacher and I looked into yoga for thoracic kyphosis and low back pain in adults with CF for my master's. And um, I have also been uh, spoken a few times at NACFC previously on the topics of yoga and adherence. I co-founded BEAM or PAXA as we were called back then um, almost six years ago. And um, uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you a bit more about that shortly. So what I hope for you to get from this session, I would like to provide you with an overview of the different types of online resources that are available um, and think about how they can support your patients and complement your care. I'd like to discuss the opportunities and challenges of delivering um, remote group exercise education and wellbeing sessions to the community uh, with some considerations for practice and just have a chat as well around what we're expecting um, for future care. So this is a brief overview of online solutions. The ones in purple are the mainstream um, uh, services that are out there. The ones in yellow are the more disease specific ones. So the purple ones, some of these you may already be using. Tracking devices will be things like uh, Apple Watch, your Fitbit, um, your Garmin, Garmin devices and so forth. Things that are tracking your activity, maybe your heart rate and other outcome measures as well. Fitness subscriptions, um, the, the, the number of platforms out there now that you can sign up to has absolutely um, boomed over the past uh, almost two years. Um, you'll see that there'll be exercise platforms for people uh, interested in, in yoga or dance or HIIT or any number of types of exercise disciplines and even um, sessions that may be focused around specific goals or, or needs as well. Um, there will be free online classes that you can access on YouTube. Example, Yoga with Adrienne or, um, or Joe Wick's classes or, uh, and plenty of kids content there too. The thing with it, I suppose to say, obviously with any mainstream uh, sessions that you may be recommending is just quite checking the quality of the instruction first, even compared to what if you refer someone to a local leisure centre, um, they what anyone can post on YouTube and you just want to know sort of what someone's credentials are, obviously. Um, well-being and fitness apps, mobile apps um, will have programs that people can follow through. They may also integrate with um, some of the wearable technology. So um, the other advantage with, that you'll get with, um, with mobile apps as well is that there'll be more um, integration of push notifications, of behavior change features, um, ways that people are using tech for good. And then the bottom three, um, obviously, remote personal training, remote uh, physical therapy, um, what any seeing exercise physiologists, any members of the MDT, especially if they're one to one consultations, obviously, they're going to be highly personalized and um, uh, and tailored to the specific needs. Um, but an, another way of receiving care virtually and uh, in that conven same convenient way. Condition-specific apps exist for conditions like COPD, diabetes, weight management, cardiac rehab. BEAM is an example of a condition-specific app for cystic fibrosis, whereby our content is tailored for a specific community. So a little bit more about BEAM. Um, we, um, we've been around for almost six years. Uh, we were originally called Paxter. We started in the UK uh, in collaboration, uh, working with um, CF physios there, as well as the Cystic Fibrosis Trust. We focus um, mainly on supporting adults with CF, but um, I'm planning uh, on work to support kids. And the platform, um, we in 2019, we piloted with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and four care centers in the US, which led to um, being, uh, being freely available to adults with CF across the US, thanks to this ongoing relationship with this, the foundation. 
So any of you clinicians in the US, uh, if you want to refer patients through to the platform, they can just come straight on, sign up. They don't need a promo code or anything. Um, but we do have some arrangements where it's free in other countries as well. I just recommend that you get in touch with me and uh, I'll be able to give you the accurate information. Um, it is also free for clinicians wherever you live in the world um, for you to use with your inpatients. So what we offer, we offer progressive programs um, to help people get started uh, with physical activity um, and uh, regardless of where they're at with their disease. So it might be that they have mild, moderate disease, they could have advanced disease or be um, transplant. Um, we also offer live and on-demand classes um, uh, available for people to do, um, obviously live classes at set times, on-demand, um, whenever suits them. And there, um, all our sessions are led by instructors either living with or working in CF. We use different behavior change features to try and encourage long-term engagement, such as a data tracking dashboard, being able to uh, track their offline activity as well, uh, being able to save and schedule things to their calendar. But then there's other things that we do to try and enhance motivation and adherence, such as a social element um, of using forums and um, cheerleading one another, uh, connecting in groups, and, and also the language that we we use um, to make sure that we are not that we aren't intimidating to people who don't identify as exercisers and uh, we're constantly reminding people about the feel-good benefits of movement. Beam Clinics is a service that we offer where we support clinicians to deliver their own sessions to their patients in a private group. So clinics can set up uh, their own live class timetable, their own on-demand video library, um, and they can have a wall where they can have a chat uh, with their patients or, or just have a, a one-way stream where they send updates and motivational messages to their patients. Um, they are closed and secure groups um, and you have to give people permission to, to join. Clinicians can also see a tracking dashboard um, where they can look at the uh, classes their patients are doing, uh, how they're rating themselves pre and post, how they're rating the class, which classes are most popular and so forth. There's been some really great trials done by different centres um, in the UK using Beam Clinics. Uh, Lisa Morrison at West of Scotland presented at the European CF conference how they done a six-week pilot um, with 39 patients and saved 147 clinical hours because they were able to deliver groom group consultations to CF patients, whereas obviously it had always been one-to-one -one and saving um, time, um, as well as helping people meet their goals and increase their motivation. Other centres have done phenomenal work. All Wales are doing great work to uh, engage their community to move more by doing specific campaigns around getting people um, collectively to work towards exercise targets. So some things I want you to think about, if you plan to create on-demand content or, or have already, or you're wanting to host live sessions, here are some sort of considerations for practice for you. So on-demand sessions are good. They can be available for people to do anywhere at any time. Um, the challenge with on-demand, when you create an on-demand video, though, is, of course, you don't get to see the person doing it. You don't get to see their technique, what level they're exercising to, and there's, there's not the accountability. Um, when you're creating the content, obviously, you need to think about uh, modifications. You need to think about where you're going to host it to make sure that your target audience does see it and will continue to use it. And also on the topic of wanting to continue to use it, then you might need to think about how frequently you're going to put new content out there because people do have expectations to see, see new content and to keep things fresh and interesting. You can obviously do an on-demand video very low budget just with your phone, or you can do a flashy video with two cameras and editing and lights and audio and go all out. So the, the cost to set them up can really vary. Live sessions are great because they give an opportunity for um, the people attending to interact with the instructor and their classmates. So there's a social element, there's fun, there's accountability. Um, it's obviously set at a set time though, so it's harder to fit into someone's schedule. If you're hosting live sessions, the technology, you may be limited by the technology you can use. 
some uh, technology will be more favorable than others because then some may have a limit to the number of people who can join a class. Uh, Zoom allows you to do polls, which I find really great for doing the risk assessment pre-classes as well. Um, the other three points I've written here, uh, I'm actually going to cover on the uh, coming slides. But some other things I just wanted to mention about teaching a live class um, is when you're setting up the space, um, have a practice run, of course. Uh, make sure that you've got good audio, good lighting, you've got enough space to demonstrate um, and that everything's aesthetically pleasing. Plan your class. Um, know how many classes you're intending to teach in a week um, and who is your audience going to be and what type of session for how long, at what time, da 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 You might choose to send out surveys to your patients to find out, gauge interest before you actually make a decision. And remember that when you do create classes, you can create a class for a subsection of a population as well. It doesn't have to be a one class for everyone. Um, if you do do a one class for everyone, it's going to make it harder for you to offer enough modifications, variations of the exercises, as well as um, it's going to make it harder to navigate the chat um, because people will have quite different needs as well. Um, Promoting your class as well is really key. People will come and go at different times and you just want to make sure that it's always open and available for them to attend. So on the topic of safety considerations and risk management, thinking about exercise testing, you um, as uh, CF clinicians uh, will hopefully have seen your patients in clinic um, not too long ago. Maybe they've had an annual uh, review done where you've done a, an exercise test on them, but you can always do um, a functional exercise test remotely, like doing a sit sand 60 to get some outcome measures if they're not coming in. Obviously, if you need to do an oxygen, if you need to assess them, oxygen they need to do that in person um other things to consider though is is just um you know if you if you are exercising people who've known to have hemoptysis or the advanced disease like are you going to get those people um exercising when there's someone else around them do you need to modify certain exercises for people with bone density issues reflux and so forth i use polls before my classes to find out whether people are okay lying flat and what issues and i ask people to let me know directly as well if they have any other problems going on but you know you will do your own risk assessment you just need to remember that although it's been done virtually a lot of the same principles still apply as they would in person such as your staffing ratio um, to making sure you've got enough eyes on all the patients and also what's your procedure for managing any adverse events uh, that may happen during a, a virtual class are you um, contacting next of kin or whatever like look through your policies this is an interesting one. The group dynamics is challenging, um, and it's and it's another um, um, reason that you may want to go down the route of, uh, of of setting up multiple live classes for subsections of the community because of how triggering and, and sensitive some topics can be someone at very different uh, spectrums of the disease hearing the frustration someone else may be having may be may be hard for for all parties. Also thinking about how you'll set manage sensitive information. Obviously, if you're in a group, uh, in-person group exercise class, like a pulmonary rehab class, and someone had something they wanted to bring up, you could you could edge away from the group and have that quiet conversation. But when you're all on a Zoom screen together, it's harder to to have that chat. So you might decide to follow up afterwards with a conversation or privately message them during the session. You want to still make space, make sure though that everyone understands that this class is a safe space and what's spoken about in here is confidential. Um, and obviously you want to encourage that culture. For those people who may be um, self-conscious, um, uh, they they can choose to, you could give them the option to switch their video on or off, or maybe even use an alias um, when they're in the class as well to give them some anonymity. Attendance and sustained engagement. You know, it's, um, it's just because it can yeah, it can feel easy in a way that if you put it online, then people should theoretically just come. But of course, not everyone is ready 
uh, to engage with exercise. You know, think of your stages of change model. Think about how would you normally be getting someone involved? You're using your motivation interviewing techniques. You're you're helping with goal setting. Um, you're helping maybe with exercise prescription. Those things are still needed, even if it is easier. It's perceived to be easier because it's done virtually. Um, and your um, your support can obviously really enhance their engagement with online um, sessions. Just be continue to be open with com- communication. Um, as I said, people will come and go. You want to make sure that everyone knows that the services are there for whenever they need it. And you can always be setting up reminders, nudges and motivational campaigns. So looking to the future, where do we think things are going? Um, the pandemic has obviously seen a massive um, increase in the acceptability of telehealth and online services. There's also been a massive growth in the tech industry when it comes to health tech and fit tech. Um, so we're seeing and mental health support as well. So we're seeing services constantly growing, which is really exciting. And um, there will be preferences that some people will want certain things done in person uh, and you as a clinician will We'll want certain things done in person, but um, it, the, the, the combination of all that change uh, in the delivery of care plus the module, the uh, introduction of modulator therapies, um, changing um, like the lines, the style of lives people are living and the outlook, um, as well as changing the importance of exercise for them, are all kind of setting us up for. This type of service having um, having ongoing and increasing importance, and that this isn't just a, 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 a something that will be used during a pandemic, but it's very likely to be something that's used beyond the pandemic um, uh, to support people with CF going further. And excitingly. You know the, the the developments in wearable technology, the remote exercise, the remote testing, um, will will continue to um, mean that we can start to collect more uh, remote outcome measures and and uh, real life research um, data as well to to understand um, uh, how things are impacting people's lives even more and and continue to build that clinical picture. Fit um, emotional health apps as well um, and services uh, as well continue to grow. So it's 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 certainly like there's lots more I could say about this, but to keep it brief, uh, it's going to be a really interesting and exciting time. And and certainly these services that have been developed, um, the feedback that we're getting from the patients is that they want to see them continue to flourish and that it's been you know game changing for them. So I'm just leaving you with this quote here, which was from one of our members about how the platform has um um, the online platform has given them a chance to get more active than they have in a very long time, as well as um, make a group of friends um, who understand them like no others. So it's, um, yeah, it's it, through through a very difficult couple of years and having seen patients go through such enormous adjustments with modulated therapies and and with the pandemic um it's uh these virtual solutions truly are a, a, a gift as far as being able to help people feel less alone um okay so thank you for watching this and joining listening in on my symposium about my perspective as a patient living with cystic fibrosis during COVID-19 or the most heightened part of the pandemic. So again, as I mentioned, this is my patient perspective during COVID-19. My name is Cheyenne Hayes and I live in San Clemente, California. So clinic status during COVID-19. Our clinic or Chalk Children's Hospital in Orange County did not shut down completely. However, telehealth visits were administered through Zoom as a substitute for in-person visits. I felt that at home, Zoom worked just fine and I had no issues. I was able to log on fine and 
everything worked as it should. When we could go back, when patients could go back into the clinic, they chalk required a negative COVID test at first. So I believe I took a total of about two, I think it was just two COVID tests before they opened up um, clinic to in-person. Um, now, you know, currently as we're speaking, they just require the patient to fill out a COVID screening, which is just answering questions about if you've been in contact with anybody, if you have any symptoms, et cetera. And Chalk also uses Zoom while you're in the clinic for some specialists and physicians who wish to not visit the patient in person um, because they prefer Zoom or they can't for other reasons. Home spirometer. spirometer. I did receive a home spirometer device and the device itself was not too hard to work, but it did kind of take one round of quote unquote training by an RT to really figure it out. So the during an in-person, in-clinic visit, the RT had me demonstrate how I use the spirometer machine to, to see like how I was doing it. And uh, after seeing that, he kind of made some corrections and coached me on how to correctly use it. And I think what I was doing wrong was that I was I was breathing out at the wrong time and I actually had to breathe in. It was, I feel it was opposite of what I'm used to on a normal spirometry device that um, we use in clinics. So that's why it kind of confused me at first. But after that, I got a hold of it and the app that it's linked to works perfectly fine. It's not that confusing to figure out. And I really didn't have any issues. Um, and I was able to grasp the idea of it rather quickly. As far as sharing the test results to the clinic, it was a pretty easy process. And all I did was screenshot my spirometry results that were displayed on the app itself and just emailed them to one of the RTs now I know that there is a little setting. I believe we use the Zephyr X, if I'm not mistaken, app. Um, here, actually. It's the Breathe Easy by Zephyr X app. And I, I was using, I use that. And there is a little option, I think, that it says share your results to your clinic. And so if you have that checked, it automatically shares them with, I don't know who. So I think that's why they just had me email a screenshot to them so it's more direct. And yeah, they kind of just get their um, the results easier and quicker. And I do, or I did, I should say, feel comfortable using the home spirometry machine um, that they supplied me with. It was free, by the way. And, well, free. We didn't have to pay out of pocket. And I have never had to do a sputum sample at home. Being on trichafta, I haven't have been able to get up sputum in a couple years. So that's why. I and I didn't really do it at home. And even Chalk Children's really hasn't said that I needed to while at home. Home exercise. As far as this goes, I did receive a PT evaluation during one of my visits, um, my virtual visits. And so the PT asked me, what exercise and or activities that I was doing during COVID. And she had me do a one minute sit to stand test to look at my aerobic um, capacity, excuse me. I then rated how hard my effort was on a visual modified Borg scale, rated zero to 10 with faces that kind of describe the effort, like a sad face or, um, yeah, like, a kind of a range. Um, 
She looked at the, my range of motion, muscle tightness, breathing, and postural assessment. I don't know why they ease there. That was a typo. I was provided with, an, with at-home stretches and exercise ideas before going virtual for the clinics. Um, things such as Peloton, um, as I mentioned, just stretching handouts and apps that I could use, uh, things along with yoga and just apps to help me exercise at home. Um, I did have these resources on hand during the pandemic, but I didn't really use them. Excuse me. I didn't really use them because I had to follow a routine for school within my physical education class where um, we we had to do a certain number of hours of physical PE at home during the week. So I kind of just did my own workouts, as I mentioned in the next bullet point. Um, what I did was a combination of one to one and a half hour walks and a 30 to 35 minute at home workout that I followed on YouTube, which I mostly chose to do high intensity interval training. That being said, I did make exercise a priority during COVID and I did feel comfortable participating in it on, say, walking on the streets. I was not nervous or scared, really. And there isn't many people out <laughs> where we walked anyways. And during the height, we did wear our masks if there were some people and we had them on hand, just in case. Lab work and x-rays. This topic, is there's not really much to say about it. In my case, I did have a few x-rays during COVID-19 and they pretty much went the same as before. Everything was the same check-in process. Um, the only thing different was that we were wearing masks. For labs, uh, I did a couple labs and a glucose test during the pandemic, and they were also normal. Again, masks was the only, they were the only main difference for my normal life, and there were no real restrictions um, in the lab as far, as far as that goes. My overall experience during COVID and my perspective of living with CF during COVID and clinic visits, um, as far as the virtual visits went, I feel that they were a little bit more tailored to me. That this being, this means basically that they allowed for flexibility in the in the timing because I was on online um, or at home slash virtual school. I could just hop on the computer and and you know go to my appointment, so to speak, versus driving 30 to 45 minutes to my clinic in Orange. So that was way more convenient uh, when they administered the clinics through Zoom. Uh, this did, as I was trying to touch on, take away the stress that could accumulate for an in-person visit. On the other hand, I do believe that in-person visits are more accurate as far as just the machines, like the spirometry devices and the height and weight machines and just the different tactics and systems that they use. And they provide a more one-on-one, -on -one, um, they provide more one-on-one -on -one time with the doctor like in person to ask them questions or it's just better communication. And there's no risks of any freezes or any lagging that happens or um, beyond if the one of the physicians decides to zoom in on the, on the iPad that they provide while within the clinic. Sometimes there's an issue with that, with the um, not being able to hear the audio, but it gets fixed quite um, quickly. So as my disclosure, Cheyenne Hayes, that is me. There are no relationships to disclose 
related to this presentation. Thank you for listening to my symposium on my perspective as a patient living with cystic fibrosis in South Orange County, uh, of my perspective during COVID-19, and just what that felt like and looked like for one person living with CF as a teenager, of course. Thank you. Hi, and welcome to session 23.4, the clinic experience during the COVID-19 pandemic, the patient perspective. My name is Shad Reedy, and there are no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. I'm an adult with CF who's 40 years old. I live in Alexandria, Virginia with my wife, Julie, and our two sons. And I attend clinic at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Currently, my lung function is about 35 to 40% between those numbers, um, currently closer to 40% uh, than not. Um, and most of that is because of Trikafta um, and the benefit that it has provided for me. So what was CF Clinic like in the time of COVID? Um, overall, I thought it was a relatively good experience considering how fast this snuck up on everybody. Um, and then the then then what was put in place and not being able to be in person. So overall, I thought it was it was it worked as well as it could. Um, early on in about May or March of 2020, um, my clinic decided to change from in person to all virtual clinic visits to protect not only themselves but us as as um, people with CF. Also, uh, we had our virtual visits through my chart, which was which is the system that. Johns Hopkins uses to track appointments and trade emails and have all your medications and everything. And so that's where we would log on to. And our CF clinic um, visits virtually would be hosted on that platform. Um, in addition, um, initially at the onset of the pandemic, they suspended um, lab work and x-rays, DEXA scans, those types of um, tests and procedures. Um, unless they were absolutely necessary. Uh, I believe by about maybe July or June or July of 2020, they um, started to allow us to go back and get our routine lab work and do any of those tests that we needed to. In addition, I received a home spirometry device um, and this was great. I had looked at having one of these in the, um, in the past, but had never really wanted to do it because I always had such anxiety around PFTs. And I, in my own head, I was like, why do I want to add this into the stress of being at home and, you know, give it to myself more than four times a year. Um, when in actuality, I actually have found um, the home version to be, to be great and not as anxiety inducing um, or causing, I should say. Um, anyway, it's run through your phone. Um, an app on your phone and so when you're ready to take the test you take the device um, you open up the app on your phone follow the instructions to breathe in and blow out all the way um, after you get your three tests they uh, calculate all your results and you can send it straight to your care team and they take care of they can see it um i believe almost in instantaneously um, so it's really great device to have when we've been at home and haven't been able to get in person so I wanted to just discuss some of the challenges that um, I thought that um, happened over the past 17 months with virtual CF clinic and the shifts that had happened because of the pandemic. Uh, one of them was sort of the virtual waiting room aspect of these virtual visits um, and seeing your care team at that time um, through the platform we used when you weren't actually speaking with a nurse or member uh, or doctor um, or physical therapist, nutritionist, whoever it would be, pharmacist, you would be just in a virtual waiting room. It was a blank screen um, and you just had to sit and wait for the other person to come in and pull you into their room. And so um, when there would be longer gaps in between seeing doctors, there was no real way to communicate with the other side of the screen with the care team 
to see what was going on and if I should still be waiting or if I shouldn't be waiting, um, if the other person got tied up and isn't just going to be able to make it. Um, whereas when you're at clinic, you can poke your head out of the door um, or stand in the hallway and, you know, try to, you know, see what's happening. Or a lot of times people are just coming in and out of your room continuously. And so they um, will switch places with the other member of the team that, you know, maybe held up in a meeting or something like that. And so um, it's much easier to sort of know what's happening and keep going. Whereas it's virtual range and sometimes you just felt like you were alone and didn't know if you should keep waiting or not. Um, that sort of leads into the challenges around communication. And um, as we all know, and that just sort of stems more from these virtual meetings, uh, we all know that, you know, glitches can happen, things can freeze, audio doesn't work, uh, video doesn't work, there's lags, all of those things. And that just makes sort of having a good sort of connected conversation about um, what's happening health-wise, mentally, physically, emotionally, whatever that is, makes it hard to sort of have that connection and establish that relationship, um, which leads into my last one, which was sort of the hardest for me about the past 17 months was the lack of personal connection and relationship building um, virtually. Um, you can be virtual and you can stare at each other through the screen, um, but there's something different about being in person and sitting next to that person or across from that person while you're talking about how you're feeling, how you're doing, what medicines you should be on, or if anything can be removed, or just talking about um, life. And one of the things that I value most about my clinic experience and that I have loved about my care team is the connections that I have with them and the ability to sit in a room with them and talk openly and honestly um, and sort of feed off of each other's body language and um, emotions and make that eye contact and just sort of be in the room with them and really establish that connection. And while I know those connections that I had before the pandemic are still very strong, um, they're just, there's something missing when you're virtual all the time and you can't just sit next to that person. I mean, as a person with CF, I know that, well, I have lots of, you know, friends in the community that were all virtual, but there's just sort of nothing like being able to sit in that room and talk to them. And so those were some of the key three challenges that, not just three, there were more, but those are some of the challenges that sort of hit home mostly when I sit and reflect on the past 17 months and what the issues were around virtual CF clinic and the way that it's been lately. So what worked? What did I feel that went well was um, one of the things um, that I loved about clinic in the past 17 months has been the reduction of my travel time. I live in Alexandria, Virginia, and I commute to Baltimore for clinic. And that drive with traffic can take an hour and a half to two hours or more. And so that's three to four hours each. That's three to four hours total just getting to clinic. And then if clinic takes two, three or four hours, you're looking at six, seven, eight hours away from home. And that's an entire day. And so um, that's a lot. So the ability to be able to either be at work and pop home real quick to do um, my CL clinic visits and then maybe go back to work or to be able to be at work and just maybe step outside into my car and do my visits from my car, whatever that might be, the ability not to have to sit in the car and travel was tremendous. Um, and I absolutely loved that. Um, the other thing that I really loved with the way clinic has been recently is it allowed my wife to participate a lot more. Um, we had, like I said before, we have two kids um, and she's a full-time teacher. And so being able to get work off and being able to have somebody cover or watch, not cover, watch our kids while we're up in Baltimore and maybe not home until six or seven at night, um, that can be complicated. And so a lot of times when I'm healthy, she just doesn't come if I'm stable because it's easier for her to stay home and work and then get the kids instead of having to come with me. And so having her being able to pop on from school um, and listen in and talk um, or being able to be next to me at home because we don't have to commute 
um, and the kids can come home and be around the house while we're doing this um, has been has been a real blessing. Um, the other thing has been reduced PFT anxiety. I get a lot of anxiety from PFTs when I sit in that room and stare at that machine um, and being able to have that home spirometry device um, has allowed me to relax more doing them. I get to stand up and do my PFTs instead of sitting in a chair. And I can do them sort of multiple times throughout the day if I need to, to make sure that I'm getting the best results. Um, I can do them every day. If one wasn't as well as I feel, um, I can try again. And I can also do them at the times of day when I feel good. And so um, doing them at home with that home spirometry device has caused me a lot less sort of anxiety around my PFTs. So as I wrap up here, um, I feel that CF Clinic has shifted the way we manage this disease. I think Trikafta has had a big impact on that as well. But the past 17 months, and sort of being thrown into this, this necessity for a virtual clinic option um, has been a good thing, even though there's been flaws and it hasn't, it's been messy at times and you don't have that personal connection. I love the fact that that's an option. And I hope that moving forward, that option remains. I would love to be able to maybe once a year um, or twice a year be able to do a CF clinic from home and just check in with my doctors. And then two or three times a year, you know, going in for person to just be there and continue those connections and those bonds and run the tests that need to be done and just and be be in the same space, but having the option to go virtually has been great. And I would love to see that going forward so that we can make sure it just gives an extra bit of flexibility um, to the process. And so I think that's awesome. The other thing I would love to see going forward is um, the use of that home spirometry device is maybe a way to limit the amount of times we have to take a PFT in clinic. Um, Maybe it's monitoring it once a month from home. And then once a year, you go in to take a PFT on the big machine it's at, at your clinic. Um, but being able to regularly monitor it at home and use that as sort of the benchmark for how the lung function is performing instead of having to go and sit in that room every time um, and get cold sweats like I feel I do when I go. Um, lastly is this time really emphasize the value of those connections and relationships with my care team. Um, not being able to have them as strong as I would like them to be and not being able to be in person with those people um, makes me value them and that time more and really how beneficial it is for us all to be together um, in that room, um, sharing you know how life is going, but also sharing how I'm doing and mentally, physically, emotionally, and how they are too. I think that really makes the relationship trustworthy. Um, and creates a good back and forth that allows us to continue uh, to move forward and, and allows me to receive the best care that I possibly can. So I want to say thank you for listening. Have a wonderful rest of your conference, and I hope to see you soon. Anna Guthrie from the University of Texas Health Science Center located in Tyler, Texas. On behalf of myself and my co-moderate, Danae George from Children's Hospital Orange County and located in California, she's been working hard behind the scenes to answer all your questions. We'd like to thank you for joining our symposium session. I would like to let each of the speakers introduce themselves and then we'll get started trying to answer all your questions. Pamela? Hello, um, thank you and thank you for everyone joining today and thank you for that, um, Christiana. Uh, I think I introduced myself already um, uh, in my presentation. So as I said, physiotherapist uh, by background, but now the clinical director of BEAM. I work globally, so I'm not attached um, for BEAM and I'm not attached to any specific care center, but work with clinicians around the world. I'm actually, I live in Australia now, so hello. Bailey? 
Thank you, Christiana. Yeah, my name is Bailey. I am a respiratory therapist in Utah, and it's been such a privilege to present today. Um, I will put my email in the chat of our session. So if you guys have any questions, you can reach out to me personally um, if I can't get to all of them today. But thanks again for joining. Abby? Hey everyone, um, I'm Abby Good. Uh, I work as a physical therapist at the Children's Hospital of Colorado, um, which is a pediatric center. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you joining our talk today. I'll also put my email in the chat if you have any questions um, that we don't answer. Chad? Uh, yep. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chad Reedy. I'm a patient with CF. Um, I'm 40 years old, and I go to uh, my CF, uh, excuse me, CF clinic is um, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And do you want to say hello? Sorry, are you talking about me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Danae. I'm Danae Detella George from Children's Hospital, Orange County. Um, I actually um, might be saying the responses for Cheyenne as she couldn't be here today. So um, once we get to those questions, I'll answer them. Thank you. All right, we're going to start off with you. So the first question is, um, is this the session that you do for your um, spirometry education? Is that the only part of the visit or do they see other providers during the visit? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, it does vary. Most of our education attempts are usually virtual, uh, just with the RT availability and the um, COVID-19 precautions. So all of our in-person PFTs require a COVID test right now um, for our institution. So a lot of the times we would attempt virtually just for patient convenience. If there were any barriers, such as the patient was having technical barriers, the family was having a hard time with the device use, um, we would immediately uh, suggest doing an in-person session um, just because we found that a lot of the user experience is uh, a factor that drives home spirometry usage. So um, in the event that the patient had a hard time with it, we would do it in person. Overall, as long as we standardized our education, we didn't really see a benefit of virtual versus in-person to answer your question. So I think that just whatever education uh, materials, if they're there, uh, the education quality is there. All right, good, thanks. So the next question is, how are you instructing um, disinfection of the device? Yeah, so we follow the manufacturer guidelines um, from Zephyrix. So we immediately, after every use, recommend that patients use warm, soapy water. Um, I think that they've recommended Dawn Deer Soap has worked well for the device integrity. Um, and then we soak that in hydrogen peroxide for 30 minutes after. So I just usually recommend a small cup to make sure that they can completely uh, submerge those, the mouthpiece and the turbine in that. And then we have them rinse with sterile water. So just boiling the water for at least five minutes and letting it cool just to where it's just cool enough to touch. So no scalding water on the device. Okay. Um, got some questions about the billing codes. Um, I wanna know, can you clarify more why you had to stop using the billing code and if you're using any billing codes currently? Yeah, so um, I, I know uh, maybe other centers have experienced this as a barrier. The biggest message that we were getting from our revenue cycle department is that we were using codes that weren't compliant with our current um, uh, spirometry recommendations. The biggest one was that the patient needed to own the device, uh, or at least what we were told, uh, that they needed to own the device rather than it being provided to them by the foundation uh, or paid for by the foundation. And then the other big one was that the devices need to be used on a predetermined frequency throughout the month. So whether that was a, a daily or monthly, which didn't align with our recommendations of quarterly. Um, and then documented medical necessity for use, which you saw we were doing that. Um, I'm hopeful that when 2022, they will release the CBT code and the new CBT code release um, that works for home spirometry. But at this time, we are only obtaining RBU credit for all home spirometry related uh, encounters. Okay. Um, how many RTs did you have doing the training? Um, we trained our entire RT staff. So we had uh, six in the pulmonary function lab with the exception of a couple of our newer RTs, once they were getting trained up on spirometry in person and they were confident with CF patients, we would teach them on device use. So we had anywhere from five to six RTs that were trained to provide the education. So it was never a single RT that the patient would interact with. Okay, that's great. Yeah. And uh, what percent of your patients were um, telemedicine versus coming into the clinic? Do you oh, know that? Um, 
No, I, I don't have a precise percentage for that question, um, but I do see its significance. And I think that would be something worth exploring in the future. Okay. Yeah. Um, one last question for you for right now. Um, do, do you recommend having um, PFT done prior to the physical therapy um, screening if they're having a LMS medicine visit scheduled? So um, we recommend PFTs um, provider to the, or uh, prior to a multidisciplinary clinic visit for through telehealth. Um, if that included a PT screen, we would usually recommend PFTs before exercise for sure if they were going to require PFT during that visit, because um, what our center practices is that if that patient has some sort of asthmatic component, sometimes the exercise can exacerbate that, which would lead to lower lung function data. So anytime we're doing lung function data around a physical therapy regimen, we always do PFTs first. So um, I, I hope that answers that question. It does. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you. All right. Next up, we want to hear from Miss Abby. Abby, um, they would love to hear more um, specific details on how exactly you charge uh, billing for each group session. And was it uh, RTPT? No, I'm sorry, PT psych um, separate charges and what billing codes did you use? Yeah, really good question. So um, both Courtney and myself, we each billed separately. We both wrote separate notes. Um, we did say in our note that we did the group together. Um, and I built, I build um, one group code um, it, for for the whole time that I was with them. Um, and then Courtney built um, one 30 minute code and one 15 minute code for um, health and behavior group intervention. So um, yeah, they were getting billed separately through both of us. Okay. Do you know anything about the re reimbursement for those? Codes that you were billing? Uh, I no, uh, we didn't have any issues like based on patient or family reports. Um, and I'm I'm not sure what exactly the reimbursement is. Um, but uh, I it what it does you know count as an hour of your time for each patient that's in your group. So okay. um, so that is you know, it's, it's pretty efficient use of your time and everyone else's because typically if I work with a patient for an hour, I'd bill four units. And, um, but for group, you just bill one. So really they get a lot of, a lot, um, with that one unit, especially if we're thinking about Medicaid. Right. Oh, that's great. Okay. Next question. Any thoughts for making recruitment random next time? Yeah, I, um, that's a great question. You know, recruiting is really difficult. You know, you have to have your the schedules all align. Um, and uh, so I think it would be really hard to do it random the way we're doing it right now because we don't have any incentives to participate except for that they, you know, they get the education, they, they get the uh, treatment and stuff. So I think if we had some sort of incentive, like we um, gave them... Um, I don't know, like a watch that kept track of, of their activity or we paid them, it would be much easier to randomize. Um, but really you, you need to have kids um, that fit well together um, and have everyone's schedule aligned. So I think randomization would be really tricky unless it was a more formal study. Okay. Um, so so uh, another question about the PT reimbursement. They would like to know, they said they have a lot of logistics questions. Um, how did you individualize the goals? Yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, I mean, we're so fortunate. We get to see our patients a lot. Um, the recommendation is that we do an annual um, evaluation. So I evaluate every patient every year. And so I really work would work off of their evaluation. Um, and then I'd add specific goals surrounding participation in group, compliance with home exercise program, and then when they wrote that SMART AIMS goal, um, when it was surrounding a PT thing like exercise, I would also have that in their plan. Um, but, but I would have other goals based on their individualized PT evaluation that I had done, um, you know, within the past six months. So. All right. Um, what time or day did you do all your sessions? Were there any barriers with scheduling? I can imagine so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was challenge. It's it's gotten a lot more challenging too. I will say. Um, so we did our group usually in the afternoon from about three till four thirty. Typically, kids were done with online school by around two, um, and so that seemed to work pretty well. Um, so you, typically in the afternoon, 
And teenagers too would prefer the afternoon generally. Um, so. Okay. Um, another question is, um, how has participation been um, now that we're further into the pandemic and school has went back and people are doing more of the activities that they were doing um, pre-pandemic? Yeah, it's such a great question. It's it's certainly been a struggle. Um, you know, yeah, people have sports after, they have clubs. Um, we have not run a group since school has gone back in person. Um, so we're, I think our, our new focus will sort of be the summer to target this group. And what we've started doing, which we haven't rolled out quite yet, but we're working towards, is we're offering some one-time drop-in like uh, sessions with Cordy and myself surrounding holidays and school vacations so mm -hmm. that people, we're going to use it as a recruiting tool so they can get a sense of what it feels like to interact with peers that have CF. Um, and it's less of a time commitment. So we're sort of targeting school breaks um, during the school year right now and then focusing on summer for the longer term group interventions. All right, that makes sense. Um, and are you and Courtney willing to share your manual with other therapists and clinics? They feel like that your information in the manual was awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, we put a lot of work into it. Um, you know, Courtney and I need to talk about that. Um, we, I, I mean, we want to, this is why I'm doing this talk. I want people to know that it's feasible to do something like this. And we'll have to kind of figure out if the manual, if we can send it out to the, to the masses. So her and I will have a little powwow and figure that out. All right. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. All right, Miss Pamela. So your first question, Miss Pamela, is can you elaborate more on recruitment? What are the what were the characteristics of people who ultimately participated versus not? Ooh. And did you have difficulty getting people uh, with CF to buy into the group CF exercise or supportive type groups? Yeah. I mean, online exercise isn't for everyone. These programs aren't for everyone. And it's been really interesting um, working with clinicians who are delivering these remote sessions as well as us delivering the sessions ourselves. Um, you know, some people... Some people will struggle to identify as exercises. Some people will not want to necessarily um, be exercising with other people in the CF community. However, there are those who do too. So, um, yeah, I think it's... Um, just like I said um, in the presentation, just because you create this, it's per perceived to be easy and easily accessible doesn't mean that you're going to have an immediate uptake by everyone. Um, and, uh, and it doesn't mean that everyone's going to be ready at a given time. I think that, you know, people with CF have such a huge, overwhelming treatment burden that they only may have bandwidth for so many things at any one time. Um, so, you know, what we try to do with Beam is always have an open door that when people need us, we are there for them. So we have these, we have programs that people can come and do uh, to help them get started with exercise, uh, to build their cardiovascular fitness, whether they've got mild, moderate disease or advanced. But we also always have an open door, open gym door where people can come and attend um, the, the sessions either live or do them on demand. Some of the things that we found helpful for drawing people into the program have been around the variety of content that we offer. So, you know, um, having a range of exercise disciplines, but also offering exercise and uh, uh, sorry, the education and well-being perspectives too, um, because some people might not be interested or wanting to do the exercise or a bit intimidated, but they might come along and watch an education session and be anonymous, but just kind of listen in. And once they're in that environment, they might have a bit of a look around and think, oh, actually, I might give something else a go as well. Um, yeah, did that answer the question? Yes, you did. Uh, but, but, but it's, you know, it's it's not for everyone. It's not for everyone right away. And making, I think, the key thing for us engaging uh, the community has been asking the community what they want. So we are frequently, you know, I have team members, uh, well, people working with CF, people living with CF. Um, we're very active, sort of, with our community of members, asking them what they would like to see next. Using social media for polling people, um, and being able to be responsive and bring in guest teachers and so forth. So, it, it, it is it is a challenge, um, but 
it's something that is a challenge for everyone and we're not going to give up with. Thank you. One other question. Um, is there an option for patients to ask a specialist in being about how they are progressing or feeling when they participate in the classes, especially for patients who are scared, um, scared or not familiar with exercising at all? Yeah, um, really good question. And it's something we're talking about a lot at the moment as well. Um, so there's different ways that people may come to Beam. Um, we love it when people have been directed to the platform by the clinicians, um, because obviously, like if you've spoken to your, if, if you as a clinician are having a conversation with your patients around exercise, you may know, um, you, you know, hope maybe you've been able to talk to them about what intensity they should be exercising to, uh, the types of exercises that might help achieve their goals. Um, maybe you've done some exercise testing with them as well. Um, and, and then they can know that when they are exercising on beam that they have your supervision, um, not supervision, but your, your point of contact, should they have any concerns to go back to. So like with any body exercising, you know, like, especially if you've got specific needs, you should be consulting your team about it. Right. Um, however, on the platform, we do, um, you can basically filter the programs and the sessions depending on what your needs are and where you deem your exercise capacity to be. So if you want to come and do some sessions to improve pelvic health or cardiovascular fitness, or you want advanced disease, or uh, you want high, high intensity HIIT programs, then you can focus in on what you need. People are supported um, when they come to the live sessions. Our live sessions are like little support groups um, and uh, and the instructors are there to offer um, they can't you know they're not their direct clinician so they're not going to be able to give that personal advice but they can give advice to people on how to to um, generalize statements on how to accommodate should someone have you know back pain or reflux like how do we modify um uh poses for that um so they can speak with the live instructors they can um participate in group conversations so we've got forums where they can ask uh questions as well and be supported by instructors and by other members um, okay. and that's moderated and they can also um they are given email support regularly and they can reach out to me as well and i'm happy to direct them back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. All right, Chad. Yeah. So the first question for you, Chad, if you feel um, comfortable asking this, would you like to talk about um, your concerns about getting COVID as a um, patient? What were your concerns? Sure. Um, I, you know, um, as I said in my video, my lung function is um, right now about 40%. Um, at the start of COVID, it was probably closer to the lower 30s. Um, and initially, my care team suggested that I basically just batten down the hatches, hatches and not, you know, essentially leave um, the lot that my house sits on um, because I'm concerned that if I caught COVID that um, it would be fatal. Um, or at least severely detrimental if I was able to pull through. Um, and so um, I think at the outset, um, there was a lot of sort of fear and anxiety around it. I have usually never been a um, person who is as uh, um, germ conscious or germ aware as several others in the CF community are. Um, and so when this hit, it did sort of, it caused some additional anxiety um, as COVID um, progressed and we started to learn more. Um, I became more comfortable. I still did not interact with a lot of people initially. Um, at that time, I was actually um, unemployed and not working. So it kind of was, um, I guess, if you can find a bright spot of being unemployed, um, that was one of it because I didn't have to necessarily try to um, work with my employer to stay home or try to meet any of those guidelines um, or any of the, you know, try to take any of those measures to stay safer. Um, um, and then once I, you know, got vaccinated, um, my comf you know, I became more comfortable um, and less sort of nervous about it. Um, I still wear a mask when I go into um, restaurants or buildings. Um, I don't eat in restaurants very often. I don't go into stores very often unless I need something. Um, I work full time now. Um, and, you know, I wear, um, I don't wear a mask in my office. 
Um, but I am also very familiar with people that I work with and comfortable with um, the precautions that they're also taking outside of work. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I guess sort of to sum that up, yeah, I, I was very nervous and um, anxious about it. And I have, like I said, two, I have two young school kids. And mm -hmm. so there was a lot of um, discussion with my care team too at that time when um, the kids decided that when my, the kid or the kids go to school and they decided to go back into person um, what that conversation was um, and what it meant for us as a family and sort of measuring those different risks for um, us as a family and our kids also taking their well-being into account. All right, thank you. Okay, um, how would you have felt about the lack of in-person visits for over a year if it was pre tricapta So think about before you had tricapta. Mm -hmm. how do you think you would have uh, processed of not going to the clinic for so long? Um, it would have been very hard for me. Um, again, it, it, so before I started tricapta, my lung function sat about 28%. Um, and I saw not only my care team every um, three months, but I also saw a transplant team um, every six months, every six months. Um, and um, I was definitely not as healthy then as I will, am now on Trichafta. And so I think not being able to be in clinic for a year um, would have been difficult just because um, back then a minor cold or a minor cough, you know, that could send me spiraling, um, spiraling down. And so it would have been a lot harder and a lot more nerve wracking, I believe, if, if I hadn't been on track after at that point. All right. Thank you, Chad. Mm -hmm. um, Bailey, we have another question for you. Um, Bailey, what's the correlation of the home spirometry and the lab spirometry? Do you know the correlation? Um, I don't have like a specific percentage correlation, but I do know that most of the time, um, we would consider a successful device validation if the patient was within our repeatability criteria for the ATS guidelines of 0.15 liters. But um, you run into some problems there because percent predicteds can vary so much in the pediatric population that when they're super focused or hyper focused on the percentages, sometimes like, you know, 0 0.02 liters can change their lung function by 3%. And that can that can scare these these pediatric parents. Um, so I think the biggest thing is, is the device, as long as you're getting maximal technique and you're getting um, the correct demographics, it can be spot on in my experience. Um, and, but I think the biggest barrier is just making sure that the patient is doing it with full technique and then teaching them to not just focus so much on the percentages as they're learning the device, but to look on the actual volumes, that leader volume to make sure that they're understanding that correlation there. Um, so as far as the answer goes, I don't have a, an exact percentage. I would actually be really interested to see. Um, and so if any other clinicians have experience with doing that, I would love to get an email and I would be happy if someone wants, whoever asked the question wants to email me, I'd be happy to follow up with you. Thanks, Bailey. Yeah. Um, Chad, we have another question for you. So Chad, knowing how the virtual platform works, what suggestions do you have for your care team as a way to improve communication the virtual waiting room, and maybe even keeping up with personal relationships? Um, that's a great question. I, um, I think, you know, initially when it started um, and you went into these waiting rooms, there was not really another good line of communication. So, you know, first thing would be maybe to have similar to what we do with these Zoom platforms and whatever, you know, uh, a communication or chat feature associated uh -huh. with it. There wasn't one that I was aware of. Maybe there wasn't, I just missed it. Um, <clears throat> but um, that would be helpful to be able to communicate while you're just sitting in there. Um, another way would be to provide um, another contact number that you could call or text or uh, communicate with when you're not in that virtual room. Um, and sometimes I'm sure some clinicians did. I had my doctor's phone number, but I, you know, that wasn't something that I necessarily felt was important enough for me to call him on his own phone. Um, <laughs> and I'm sitting by myself in a waiting room wondering what's next. Um, when, and a lot of times too, he wasn't in clinic, right? They were all in various places in their own homes. And so you had all these people spread out. Um, 
So, and so I think, you know, going forward, or if this ever to happen again, is to make sure that there is a, a communication line available outside of just sitting in that virtual waiting platform. Um, okay. And then as far as personal relationships, um, you know, that's a tricky one. I mean, I think when you go to clinic and you get to sit there with the people, you form those bonds and you see the same people over and over three to four, you know, three or four times a year. Um, outside of that in the virtual waiting room, it, or in, you know, virtually, it, it's just more difficult. And I don't, you don't want to ask more time of those people. Um, but I also felt like virtual clinic typically was a lot shorter because there was other things to do where you were at home. Um, and so, you know, maybe allowing for a little bit more time for each sort of connection that you're talking, or the doctor or the care team member that you're talking to, maybe that's one way that you could sort of increase that. All right, thank you, Chad. Mm -hmm. um, Abby, the next question is for you. Um, how many participants have repeated, repeated another session? Yeah, so we actually just, I mean, it, we, we only encourage kids to do one group. Um, and so we recruit new kids because um, it's sort of the same curriculum. Um, so just, just once. Uh, well, I think we'll have some repeats when we start offering more of this sort of drop-in model because um, based on feedback from group participants, we're sort of organizing our drop-in workouts around the school holidays catered to their feedback. So uh -huh. we're hoping to get some repeats with that. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Pamela, I um, have another question for you. Is being also seeing more female participants similar to the Abby's Thrive program? Um, yes, we are. Um, and when we first set it, set, started BEAM, it was actually the teen girls who we were most focused on, knowing how they do disengage with exercise um, and have that associated decline in their health. Um, so we had a bias definitely towards women in the beginning in wanting to engage them. But now, um, now, like, I love it when we get my men joining classes and the platform. Um, uh, but it, we are seeing more, we do have proportionally more women using it than men. Okay, thank you, Pamela. Um, speaking on that topic, Abby, um, was, was there a reason, uh, do you know any reason why um, males didn't participate in your program? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. It, it totally stumped Courtney and I um, because we would hear a lot of interest from males. Like we tried to recruit them in person more, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that was a better recruiting technique when you saw the patient and connected with them. I mean, similar to what Chad's saying, like, you know, you develop these personal relationships with your, with your patients. And so that was more effective at recruiting. So we would try and recruit the boys. And, and I, I guess one theory I have is just their desire to connect with peers that have CF might have not, not been enough to get them there. Um, they all said, you know, groups aren't really for me. Uh, and I don't know, maybe they, they, they had group opportunities in, in other ways and just didn't have as much interest in um, meeting other people that had CF. So I don't know. I, I, I that's my theory. But <laughs> we're, we're going to keep trying, though. I am I'm like maybe some wearable technology might just give them the extra encouragement to join us. But right. um, yeah. So All right. I have another question for you. Uh, would you ever consider allowing other clinicians to attend some of your group sessions so we could see how it works in practice? Sure. I mean, you know, we'd have, there would be some things to figure out in terms of patient confidentiality and stuff. But, um, you know, maybe it's something to consider when we think about our, um, we have our US uh, PT kind of lectures and like maybe I, we could do a little mock session. Um, but we'd be open to having that conversation for sure. All righty. Well, it looks like we got to mostly all of the questions in the inbox. I'll give you guys a few more time, a little bit more time if there's anything else you want to ask us. Overall, great session. I want really... to thank you. Okay, go Sorry, ahead. Is it okay if I answer one of the questions for yes. one of the participants that can't be here? Go right ahead. Um, so one of the questions that was asked for Cheyenne, um, one second, my computer is not 
not participating. Um, it said, if you're comfortable, could you touch on your level of fear, concern about getting COVID? Did it change? And how about what, what it was like to be a teenager and socializing or not during the early months? Um, and she responded, yes, I was very scared, nervous to catch COVID early on in the pandemic. However, as time went on and as vaccines were being distributed, my level of fear has gone down. Now I'm not too concerned if I happen to get it, mostly because I'm vaccinated. Personally for myself, I was not terribly affected by the stay at home order. I did miss my friends, but I would find ways to see them outside from a distance. As vaccines were being distributed, I started seeing them outside more without distance necessarily. When I got vaccinated, I started meeting up with them and going inside their homes with a mask. Thank you, Cheyenne. All righty, well, if there's not any more questions, I think we'd like to thank you all again for joining our sessions. And thank you again to all of our speakers for taking time to join us and create this wonderful material for this great session.